Okay, thank you. Thank you, Soren. Um, I think I've learned to say good morning. Is that close? Yeah, other than that, the only Danish I know is uh, Carlsberg and uh, Tubor, right? So that's about it. And we'll do better tonight. We'll do better tonight, of course, right. Uh, the, the, the title of this is, is Feeling Groovy. It's a groovy developer in the Java world. So normally I would talk about the topic, but I have to give you a little bit of context to show where my remarks are coming from. Uh, so personally, by the way, as, as Soren said, my name's Ken Cousin. It's Cousin like the relative, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, we think it was an Ellis Island job or something. You know, nobody knows what it was in the old country. Uh, my company's Cousin IT, but my wife pronounces it Cousin It, like the Adams family. It was her idea. Uh, so there's all the contact information. Of course, you can get a hold of me any way you like. I could, my email address is up there, too. Feel free to send me messages. My delete key works as well as anybody's. Uh, Twitter handle. I'm also on the No Fluff Just Stuff conference tour, which is which means that in the U.S. I meet lots and lots of Java developers, and I do a lot of groovy related presentations to them. So my day job is I teach technical training classes in areas related to Java, from Android to Spring, Hibernate, and of course things like Groovy and Grails and Gradle, etc. Uh, so again, I go to a lot of companies, I meet a lot of Java developers, and I try to tell them a bit about, about Groovy. Okay, moving on. I do have to point out, given the context, I do want to say one thing about un our unfortunate election season, and that is uh, I'm, I'm just really sorry. <laughs> you know. I, I will say this. I, I opened up a Groovy console, and I... I put in the parse method, you know, use the parse method from the date class, and I was able to measure the, the time between election day and now. And of course, unfortunately, I picked yesterday. Uh, so there are now 159 days to go before it's over. So we're getting there. We're getting there. I, I do, on a seemingly unrelated note, have to ask, are there any groovy companies in Copenhagen hiring, you know, uh, <laughs> depending on how these things go. All right, moving on. Pierre Simon Laplace, one of the greatest French math well, the, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, French, uh, during the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the or 18th century, the early part of the 19th century, was a contemporary of Napoleon. Worked for the you know the French government in many capacities. Was even made a marquis. Brilliant, brilliant man. But a bit of a sad story, and part of it, it turns out that when he went into mathematics, he dropped out of his studies for the clergy. His father wanted him to be a, a priest, and he dropped out of that and went into mathematics instead, at which point his father disowned him, and even though he became one of the most famous, well-known men in France, he, is, he never spoke again. Uh, and I, that got me to wondering what professions my son would have to go into that would cause me to disown him. Uh, and I've got my short list here. Uh, so first would be uh, TSA Groper, you know, our Transportation Security Administration, the, the, the security theater, et cetera. Uh, the second one would be uh, Patent Troll, of course. Uh, that would be just unforgivable, naturally. Uh, and then the third one I always used to say was any IT job that had the word evangelist in it. Now, this unfortunately reminds me of a quote from, from Albert Einstein, which I put in here. As Einstein said, to punish me for my contempt for authority, fate has made me an authority myself. Now, I'm not going to say I'm an authority, but as someone who has always had a low regard for the job title that includes the word evangelist, it struck me with some degree of horror that it turns out my job is largely groovy evangelist. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but I really can't deny the reality of it. Uh, by the way, I, I can never get rid of that picture because I'll never have that much hair anymore. <laughs> it's sad. So since this is what I do, I mean, it's one of the major parts of my job is to talk about groovy and groovy-related topics to people outside the groovy ecosystem, that's largely what I'm going to be talking about with you, is uh, what sorts of things do I bring up, what tends to work, what sorts of objections do I run across, where are the major debates going on, and a lot of it will be perception versus reality. 
So I'll start off by just giving you, since I'm assuming everybody here is a Groovy developer, I'm just going to give you a little list here of the sorts of topics I use to show how nice Groovy is to people in the Java ecosystem who aren't necessarily Groovy developers. Uh, things like the Groovy JDK, which I'll illustrate in a moment, the native syntax for collections, of course, using pogos rather than pojos. Uh, my gag on that, of course, is I tell them about pogos and I say I hear in... Uh, Python, they refer to them as popos, which sounds vaguely disgusting, you know. <laughs> and if you really want to upset a Ruby on Rails developer, which is not hard, admittedly, uh, you refer to poros because the, they seem to still be offended that Java still exists. They don't even want to be reminded that anybody goes into that. Uh, at any rate, then there's things like the safe navigation operator and the slurpers and the builders and the metaprogramming. As a quick demo, this is... Um, from the Groovy JDK, of course, you just put a website in a string and you invoke the two URL method to convert it to a java.net.url and invoke get text by using the text property and bang, you've got a web page. You know, you downloaded the source code associated with a website. That's a really quick and easy demo you could do. Just open the Groovy console and try that out and Java developers go, whoa. And then, of course, the next line is, you think there's a RESTful web service in your future? And yes, of course, there will be. This is another one just from the Groovy JDK. I saw Paul King do a presentation like this in association with testing. This, uh, the combinations method on collection takes a list of lists, if you will, and returns all the combinations of category one with category two with category three. Again, it's a great way to generate a series of test cases if you're into the so-called generative testing mechanisms. And it's just a method right on the Groovy JDK. Just wonderful little sample there. If I look at pogos, of course, then I show a class, for example, called person with a couple of attributes in it. I throw a canonical AST transform on there. And then my point is, they say, look, that, that five lines of code gives me a class with private attributes, public getters and setters, a default constructor, a map-based constructor, a tuple constructor, a two-string method, an equals method, and a hash code method. And it's a class that can be used anywhere that Java is expecting a pojo. This tends to really get people's attention because, I mean, after all, which would you rather write? You know, it's just much simpler and, and easier, and it leads to a lot of nice discussions. The AST transforms themselves, by the way, tend to be very persuasive when I deal with the Java audience. At canonical, of course, is nice, just like at to string and at equals and hash code. But at delegate, great examples. At immutable, of course, is very popular, especially with concurrency these days. And it's so very difficult to make a, an immutable object in Java at all. And the annotation does most of the work for you. At sortable generates all the sorting mechanisms, etc. So if you're ever trying to show off how nice Groovy is for Java audiences, keep those in mind. As, you know, great demos. By the way, I'm going to show you my GitHub repository that has all this code in it. You're welcome to take anything helpful, you know, whatever you like out of there. Uh, steal, I guess, actually, in our ter the term would be reuse, right? Uh, but feel free to do so. Here, I, I always like this. I show them a department class with a manager in it and then a manager class with a string. And when I instantiate the department with a boss and a name, then I can traverse the graph, d.getboss.getName, d.boss.name, and it's great. But then I say, what if I put in a new department and I have to traverse without hitting the null pointer exception? And I just throw in the question mark dot, the safe navigation operator. I have seen Java developers get tears in their eyes. They're so happy about it. <laughs> Really? I don't have to write all those null checks? <laughs> I'm so happy. I mean, it's amazing. That tiny bit of syntax tends to win over more Java developers than half of the major parts of the language at all. So I, I recommend that you show this to them or something like this. Uh, then I go to somewhat bigger examples. This one is accessing the Google Geocoder. So I put in a, the base URL and I put in a list that has an address in it. By invoking the collect method with a closure, I can use Java's URL encoder class. So again, I'm mixing Groovy and Java very freely. So I can encode everything and join them with a comma. That gives me my encoded address. Then by using the XML slurpers parse method, I access the website, download the response, which in this case is an XML, parse the XML, convert it to a DOM tree, hand me the root, and the rest of it is just traversing the tree, and this will give you a latitude and longitude in nine lines of code, you know? And this works all over the world because in reality, it's, it's Google, you know? <laughs> I'm just invoking a Google RESTful web service. I have to say, 
by the way, that of course the Google geocoder only supports GET requests. So I have a friend who likes to call those getful web services. And of course then I had to reply, well, does that mean if it's stateless, it's a forgetful web service? Yeah, I know. There's just not many people I can inflict that joke on, so you're one of them, you know. So at any rate, this is a nice simple demo. I turn that into a, a, a Grail service when I do my Grails tutorials and teaching, just to show them we can put little castles on a, on a map, whatever. Uh, here, on the other hand, is accessing ICNDB.com, the Internet Chuck Norris database, a database of Chuck Norris jokes. And this one is my JSON example, because this way I can limit it to the nerdy one. Be sure to limit your demo to the nerdy category. Most of the jokes there are not, shall we say, suitable for public consumption. Um, I put in, of course, Andre Salmire, because that's how I think of when I think of Chuck Norris. And convert the map into a list with uh, key equals value and then join them with an ampersand to make a query string. Plug that into my URL with the base and then the query string because the base ended with the question mark. Convert it to a URL, download the text. Sometimes I print it, but I use the JSON slurper to parse it. And then the, the response is a JSON object that has an inner JSON object under the key value. And then under that JSON object, there's a, a key called joke. And as we can see, Andres Almire can instantiate interfaces, which I've always believed anyway. You know. So again, these are the sorts of examples are very simple to do in a demonstration and tend to be very persuasive. Now, uh, by the way, that date calculation I showed you for the election, I was using java.util.date for there, but of course in Java 8 we have the local date class, and apparently the Groovy JDK has not added all the same operator overloads to the Groovy or to the java.time package yet. Uh, well, but that's easy enough to do, and just using a little bit of metaprogramming, I got the meta class and added the minus method myself, so that I'm basically the minus method is using the until method inside the, the local date class. So again, if I create election day and great conf, I can demonstrate the length, or I can use my minus method and see that we have, well, now 159 days, but when I ran this, 160 days to go. So again, a quick and easy demo of Groovy metaprogramming and how simple it is to make an, a class somewhat easier in the interface simply by delegating or even aliasing might be the best term to existing methods. Very simple to do. Uh, if you are interested in any or all of those examples or a ton more, my GitHub repository is at github.com slash my last name, K-O-U-S-E-N. And then these are all in the intro Groovy project there. Again, feel free to grab that or anything else. I also have a bigger example that I didn't have time to show here where I actually access Flickr using a RESTful web service and download a bunch of cat pictures and use a swing builder to create a swing user interface with that, which almost but not quite makes swing useful, actually. Uh, so I've got a demo for that as well. Uh, so feel free to take a look at those. It's always nice to do in a demo. All right, so all of that was just giving you an idea of the sorts of technical things I use to try to persuade Java developers or from other languages of the value of Groovy. And again, the other thing, the other point I make to them is that if they're looking at alternative languages and they want to go into Scala or they want to go into Clojure or whatever, I say, well, that's great. More power to you. They're, they're excellent, outstanding languages. But they are fundamental paradigm shifts in how you approach problems and how you think about the world. Now, that's probably a feature, not a bug, but it's, it's true. Whereas the argument I make is that if you stay in the Java world, if you're going to code in Java, then there's no reason not to add Groovy. Groovy only makes your life easier. You don't lose anything. You can use everything you had. And if you're coding in Groovy and you don't know the proper Groovy idiom, you can almost always write the Java idiom and chances are it'll compile and work and someone else can come by and show you how to make it, as we say, groovier. So it's a really nice point to point out to them. They don't have to wholesale adopt a new language. They don't have to learn everything about it before they can be productive. They can add it incrementally and make their life easier and freely interact with existing Java with no problems at all. Okay, now talking about Groovy's basic popularity, one of the things that's come up recently is that so-called Tyobi, however you pronounce it, index of language popularity. Now none of the metrics on popularity really make much sense. 
but this one has been significant in the fact that Groovy has broken into the top 20 and stayed there for several months now. So if we're just focusing on the trend rather than the actual numbers, this is significant. Now, I did put the percentages on there to say we're kind of arguing over scraps here. You know, I mean, we're talking about very small percentage of, of developers relative to, say, Java or JavaScript or any of the other major languages. But still, if you compare it to, say, Scala, Scala was well down on the list, and Clojure was included in what they called the next 50, which was 51 to 100. They just listed alphabetically. They didn't actually give the numbers for that. So I'm just showing that. Uh, as an aside, Kotlin was not listed, and yeah, I'll come back. I, I, I see Baruch made it to the talk, yes, very good. <laughs> Speaking of drunken presentations later, yes. I'm looking forward to the puzzlers, yes. 169, well, we'll and I will have further words to say about Kotlin later, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Now, Stack Overflow did a big developer survey, and there's a big web page that has lots of data about that. I focused on one particular part, was the part that said most popular technologies used as opposed to the ones they aspire to. Uh, Java was very high. You know, Java was pretty close to the top. Groovy, again, very small, but much bigger than Scala or Clojure, and Kotlin was listed. Now, if you look under the languages that they aspire to, Groovy still ranks pretty well. Kotlin moves way up, Clojure moves way up. You know, these other languages go through fads. It's funny how a language named Groovy has never been the so-called hipster language, you know, the one that all the cool kids wanted to get into. I'd like to think of it as a quiet language. It's the language that just makes your life easier without making a big deal out of it, you know? And when they say, oh, we need to see success stories, well, most of the Groovy success stories are Java success stories where they just added Groovy to make your life easier wherever it happened to help. I, I tell people that the vast majority of major Groovy projects have Java in them, if nothing else, through the libraries. It's, it's more of an integration language than something that's going to force you to replace what you have. And therefore, it's not as showy. Now, we'll talk about other issues, too, but I just wanted to mention that, and especially if you compare it to the other so-called alternative JVM-based languages, like Scala or Clojure, or, of course, now Kotlin. You see where it ranks. Now, this is the Indeed.com job trends graph. If you go to Indeed.com slash job trends, you can put in a bunch of key terms, and it will search job listings and look for those terms. So this is a lagging indicator, because the job listings already have to be there, and you know how uh, technical recruiters are. Uh, by the way, do you know the difference between a technical recruiter and a used car salesman? Uh, the used car salesman at least knows when he's lying to you. Okay. Uh, I adapted that. That's not mine, but feel free to reuse it, as I say. You can see the orange line on here. This is Scala. And the green one is Groovy, and down here, I'm sorry, the blue one is Groovy, the green one is Clojure. And interestingly enough, when I put Kotlin in here, that's that zero all the way across. As I say, it's a lagging indicator. Now, I don't know whether that means that Indeed doesn't search for it or doesn't, uh, has, or that the recruiters have not yet listed it. I don't know. I'm sure that will change. But as of last week when I did this diagram, that's where we were. Again, though, keep in mind, we're talking about a tenth of a percent of all the job listings. We're not talking about a huge number. You can go there and experiment with this, however, and look at things like Grails or Gradle or, well, Jeb or whatever else you're interested in trying out. Just don't put spring on there or everything else becomes noise, you know? <laughs> yeah, or HTML5 or something like that. At any rate, you see that Groovy is still stable, it's still active, it's not, it, it goes through, yeah, I always say it's like if Ruby on Rails was a comet that hit the Java world and knocked out all the dinosaurs, you know, then, then Grails and Groovy, et cetera, they're like the tide coming in, you know? It comes in, it, it grows a little bit, then it goes back out for a little while, and then it comes in again a little bit more and out, back out a little bit, and then grows a little bit more, slow but steady. I will tell you that my experience giving talks on the No Fluff, Just Stuff tour is that when we do, when I do Groovy talks now, uh, I tend to almost fill the room now. I mean, there's a lot of interest in it, and I don't think it's me, because uh, unfortunately when I give Grails talks, we have trouble getting people to come. So uh, there's a lot of issues going on here, but I will say that Groovy is, seems to be on waxing side of the, of the 
trend, the cycle, if you will, that it's growing in popularity and in influence lately. Uh, part of the reason for that is Gradle, and of course, I'll come back to that too. So, All right, now, what about Grails? Of course, Grails moved to Grails 3 at the end of March of 2015, after the pivotal divorce, I like to call it. And of course, now, since then, it has been through 3.1, and now 3.2, uh, Milestone 1 was released just this week. Graham is going to have a lot to say about that. I think it's tomorrow, might be partly today. It's tomorrow, definitely. Uh, he's, he's got a, I know he's got a keynote about it, but there will be other talks that refer to it as well. Uh, wonderful technology. I like to tell people what's the difference. Of course, it uses Gradle, uh, which is a, a that kind of a leveraging mechanism that allows you to understand how the dependencies are handled and, and all those things. It's got the, the whole profile mechanism now. We've got a REST profile and an Angular profile and several others. I think it's actually called REST API, but it's still basically an easy way to build a RESTful web service. And then, of course, the term that I heard yesterday from Graham, which I hadn't heard before, was Rx Gorm. I mean, how cool is that? A reactive mechanism for handling your persistence. I'm really looking forward to seeing that, and I know that'll be a topic that Graham will discuss in detail. So, at any rate, that's Grails. And besides, I talked to Jeff Brown, and he promised to update Definitive Guide for Grails. Well, no, he didn't, but we can hope that eventually that will happen. Uh, I don't see him. He's probably hiding from me. At any rate, so there's a lot of really good technology in Grails, and this is a common theme that I want to emphasize throughout the Groovy ecosystem. The technology is very solid, very mature, very good, high quality, gets the job done. We're having some perception issues that have to do with how we're viewed from outside, not the actual reality of the technology. As they would say in the stock market, the fundamentals are there. The, the basic quality is fine, and the enthusiasm is there, and the, the people are there. It's a perception issue that we have to battle, and I'll keep coming back to that. Of course, Gradle is one of the major growth areas of people interested in Groovy. It's the definitive build tool in the open source world. Of course, it's growing with the adoption throughout industry. Uh, I, I teach training classes. I'm getting more and more requests to do Gradle-related classes. For a while, it was Grails, then it was Groovy. I still get Groovy. Now I'm getting a lot of interest in Gradle as well. And, of course, just a lot of people just seriously hate Maven. Uh, I, I've never seen a technology so widely adopted and so universally loathed as Maven, unless you count maybe every Microsoft technology ever. But other than that... Yeah. Oh, but what about Kotlin, right? I mean, didn't Gradle Incorporated say they were going to support Kotlin and recommend Kotlin for plug-in development? Well, I'm, no, sorry, not ready to talk about this yet. It, it's coming, but we're, we're not there yet. But yeah, that, that's coming. Okay, now let's talk about that pivotal divorce because a lot of our perception problems in the industry come from that moment. So there's a little bit of history. In, in November 2008, SpringSource acquired the G2O1 company, the company that was, that was created by many of the core team members of the Groovy and Grails teams. I think it was about a dozen of them. Uh, they were doing consulting and training and all sorts of things, working on the framework. And and then in 2009, VMware acquired SpringSource. That's the one that surprised me. I didn't see that as a natural blend, where, of course, Grails was based on Spring, and Groovy has always played nicely with Spring. I wasn't surprised about the original. And then in 2013, VMware decided to split off and create Pivotal, a wholly owned subsidiary where most of the development work went. And everything was going along fine until in January of last year, Pivotal announced that by the end of March, they were no longer going to be supporting Groovy and Grails. It's amazing the amount of PR bang for the buck, negative PR, that this has created. Way beyond the reality. I mean, looking at the... Uh, now, by the way, why did they do this, for example? Now, supposedly the answer is, is that they were getting rid of a lot of their ancillary parts so that they could focus everything, or as I say, go all in on Cloud Foundry their cloud tool, which is doing reasonably well in the marketplace. I don't know if it's doing great or not. I haven't seen any relative numbers, but I keep running into companies that are interested in it and use it, and that's all well and good. But if that's what they're focusing on, did, did they get rid of Spring? Well, no, no, Spring's still in there. Uh, did they realize that Grails is still based on Spring? Is it, apparently they forgot, you know. 
uh, did they realize that deploying Grails to Cloud Foundry was one of the best ways to sell Cloud Foundry? I mean, it was a one-step install. It was gorgeous, but they kind of forgot about that as well, I guess. Uh, so what's the real reason that they got rid of Groovy and Grails? Now, I, I'm not there. I can only guess. But to me, the most likely answer is they're just stupid. I mean, <laughs> they really hurt themselves, and I don't know what the benefit was. I really don't. They employed some of the best developers I've met in my life and decided, nope, nope, sorry. Even though you're doing wonderful work for us and, and relevant work for us, nope, we're not interested. And I really do believe they will eventually come to regret this. But regardless, this is the reality. This is what we have to deal with. So let's talk about perception versus reality. Now, I'm not one of those people that believes that perception is reality. I believe reality is reality. But perception is something we're going to encounter all the time. Now, what actually happened when Pivotal pulled out? Well, three Groovy developers and three Grails developers total had to find different jobs. This is not a big group of people. I mean, we're, I know many companies that employ more than six Groovy-related developers, and if they decided to go in a different direction, it would not have nearly the impact, okay? And yet, somehow, this got into the popular press and hurt Groovy in the industry. By the way, all six of them were successfully employed very quickly. Not a big surprise in this market at all, but also knowing the people involved, I'm not at all surprised. A uh, few of them wound up going to Gradle, by the way. Uh, there's your Gradle logo with the, the grumpy Gradle fan and the little, I don't know why it's a Twitter bird. Well, it's not Twitter, but it's a bird in there, you know. Uh, but no, still not quite ready to talk about Gradle yet. It, it's coming, okay, it's coming. So, of course, as Guillaume Laforge tells, and, and he does a great presentation on how Groovy evolved, and he talks about the move to Apache, becoming a, an incubator project at Apache very quickly, and then in November turning into a top-level project at Apache, so that now you can go to a site that says Apache Groovy and still uses the same logo and the same website and everything, but has, is now supported by the infrastructure and the systems associated with the Apache Software Foundation. I have been surprised at how much credibility that ultimately gave Groovy. But then again, I'm an insider. I already thought Groovy had credibility. But the, the Im, Apache imprimatur, you know, the, the stamp of approval by Apache, apparently turns out to have carried a lot of weight with a lot of companies. And therefore, the interest has gone up. Now, Grails, of course, took a different direction. The Grails support wound up at OCI, and thank you very much, OCI. Uh, did a great job for that. And OCI has already scaled up their Grails development team. They're up to a dozen people. It's, they have done more for Grails directly than Pivotal ever did, even though Pivotal had all these opportunities and all these people. OCI has been a wonderful steward there. The only difficulty I find in the marketplace is that they're just not that well known. I mean, they're just that much smaller. Again, it's hard to break through the perception issue of, well, it's not a major, major company, and, you know, who is OCI? And I try to say, no, 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 they're doing great on all this, but still, it's something we have to, to deal with on a regular basis. But there was one other unfortunate side effect that I don't know that anybody really thought about for a while. And when Pivotal pulled out, that was the end of Groovy and Grails Tool Suite. Now, by the way, that was partly my clue that this was coming. Groovy and Grails Tool Suite stagnated about a year before this all happened. You could see that people weren't working on it, and they weren't trying to fix things. And while the Groovy support inside of Eclipse, the Groovy plugin, was okay, and it's still okay, the Grails support became totally unusable, and there was no plan at all to support Grails 3 and so on and so on. And this website at, at Pivotal is still there. If you, if you search for a GGTS, Ruby and Grails tool suite, you get this site talking about the support for a limited time and really discouraging anybody from using it. Before Pivotal jumped into the fray, the Eclipse support was mediocre, but it wasn't, it was largely because a handful of people were working on it on their own time. You know, nobody was funded to do this. They were doing the best they could, and it was doing okay, but it still had a lot of issues. When Pivotal jumped in, then it improved by leaps and bounds. I mean, the, the initial improvement of the Groovy plugin was almost immediate. The Grail support in the early versions of GGTS was excellent. And at the time, of course, Eclipse and Eclipse-based tools dominated the developer industry. Now that Pivotal has left, 
nobody's picked this up. There's nothing going on. It's just dead. And this is a serious problem for anyone who can't convince their company to buy IntelliJ IDEA. That's the problem. And there are a lot of developers out there who are stuck working on Eclipse or Eclipse-based tools. And if we want them to use Groovy, there's got to be Eclipse support. And while I say the Groovy plugin is adequate, the Grail support is horrible. And Gradle, I have never trusted any Gradle plugin in Eclipse. I always go out to the shell and use Gradle out that way. Now, they currently have their build ship plugin, and I've heard decent things, but Again, for me, that's still guilty until proven innocent. I, I've never had a problem adding my Eclipse plug into Gradle, going out to the shell and say, clean Eclipse, Eclipse, and just refresh my project, and everything has been fine. Uh, but at any rate, we do need support inside the IDE at some point. So how are we going to fix this? Who's going to pick up Eclipse support? And the biggest problem I find is that all the really good developers who I know who would be qualified to do this, are no longer interested because they've all moved to IntelliJ IDEA, you know? Uh, if they're good enough to have that kind of quality, they tend to be able to choose their own IDE, and therefore they tend to pick something that's already good rather than spending all their time on Eclipse. There's some question in the industry now, by the way, as to how much anybody's supporting Eclipse as a whole. So this is casting a bit of a pall, but it's still the, the freeware alternative. Now, of course, if we follow the pivotal analogy, the logical per, you know, company to pick up support would be OCI, but I don't want to ask any more of them than they've already done. I hope they're considering it, but again, if they decide it doesn't make sense from a business standpoint, I can hardly blame them for that. But hopefully some company will decide to fund one or more developers to improve the Eclipse support. Until that happens, we're going to have problems. There's just no way around it, unless we can convince people to go to IntelliJ IDEA. Now, of course, the community edition of IntelliJ IDEA has Groovy support, and if you use the Grails interactive console in Grails 3, then you could still treat the Grails project like a Gradle project, and IntelliJ supports that. So it's a fallback, it's a workaround, but the native support in Grails 2 inside IntelliJ Ultimate is really nice, and people who move to Grails 3 are going to miss that if they can't afford the full product. So this is a, an issue, not a killer, but an issue that we have to deal with. Now, so the reality of all these changes with Pivotal leaving and everything is that inside the Groovy community, we went through a period of uncertainty and a little bit of worrying, but the bottom line is we're okay. Everything's working out okay inside the Groovy community. The problem is the perception. And the perception that, got, that somehow Pivotal managed to communicate was that Groovy's in trouble and Grails, old, Grails is old news and Gradle's the only Groovy project that was attracting new developers and now, of course, they decided to adopt Kotlin with this underlying message of, why did we pick Kotlin? Because Groovy wasn't good enough, you know? And it's like, oh, cripes, because we know that's not true. It's just that's the perception problem we have to deal with. A couple of related projects just have to mention. I mean, I just simply can't have Andre Sierra not mention Griffin, you know, of course. Griffin is a wonderful tool. If I ever, now, the only problem, of course, is that, you know, the, think of Peter Griffin or Stewie, the family guy. And, of course, you spell it differently. You use the European spelling, and I'm in America, so they all look at me funny. But don't worry, Americans can't spell anyway, so it's not a problem. And, but I do tell everybody, if you have any use case where you have to do a desktop app, even in Java, you owe it to yourself to take a look at Griffin. I mean, it's the beautiful MVC separation, lots of component libraries, simplifies the deployment story. It's really an excellent, excellent tool. If you're interested in desktop, Java, or Groovy, then they, you really owe it to yourself to take a look at it. So I mentioned that. Now, Rat Pack is another one that is growing rapidly Somehow, I, it doesn't seem to have broken through into the n common knowledge among the Java communities. In the Groovy community, we are more and more aware of it all the time. It's, uh, now, when you tell Java developers, oh, they, they say, what's Rat Pack? Well, you've heard of Sinatra, right? Oh, yeah, everybody's heard of Sinatra. Well, in Groovy, we call it Rat Pack, and they laugh. And I've got to say, the first time I got involved in Rat Pack is because it was called Rat Pack. I love the name after Sinatra. But, I mean, it's... it's totally different. It's asynchronous, it's based on Netty, it's got great handlers and, and Groovy DSLs inside it, and they handle massive amounts of throughput, you know, millions of requests per second. There's success story after success story, and now that there's a Learning Rat Pack book, then I'm sure that's going to wind up helping that. 
I just haven't seen it break through yet. But as far as I'm concerned, they're doing everything right. It's just a question of somehow spreading the word enough that, you know, or showing enough success stories that people go, oh, yeah, I want to do Rat Pack, therefore I want to do uh, Groovy. You know, I want to build a RESTful web service, and this is a great way to do it. How do we fight the perception problems? Well, one, for Groovy, of course, we point to the Apache project. I asked Guillaume LaForge for some of the download numbers, and he sent me a spreadsheet. I made a little graph here. This is all of the Groovy downloads by month from Codehouse, from Bintray, from Maven Central, basically. And you can see how it tracks. Again, downloads is not the best metric ever, but the trend is interesting. And you'll notice that when we hit January 2015 and went to March, there was a dip that may have been anything. I mean, as you can see on this figure, that could have been noise. But that for the rest of the year, things grew. And by the time it became an Apache project, we were starting on the upswing again. And that has continued into this year. So if you're just looking at interest in the language, which downloads is a reasonable proxy for, that's still going strong. I mean, that's doing well, and there's no indication that that's going to stop. It's just the level there was that we happened to ask for the numbers in May, you know. So I expect that to be healthy and still growing. As I say, my anecdotal evidence is I'm getting a lot of interest, definitely. How do we fight the perception problem for Grails? Well, OCI is already doing some things, and I see that they're clearly ramping up to do more. The uh, OCI blog, the Grails blog, is very helpful. They're making some Grails quick casts. They're also, of course, the Slack channel is very helpful. Here's a couple of pictures. This is the latest uh, team blog at OCI showing the 3.2 milestone one release of the framework. You see there's lots of blog posts. I expect that to grow over time and become an interesting location to, to visit, find out what's going on. Again, I'm sure Graham will be talking about that as well as others. Here is just a snapshot of one of the Grails quick casts on JSON views. Those also wind up on YouTube or on Vimeo. So they are well distributed, and hopefully people will see more of those. Um, that'll be growing, I expect. And then this, I just did a little snapshot of the Slack channel for the Grails community. This is excellent. I tell people, be sure to go in and register for that. The core team members are very active and pay attention to questions on that channel and answer them on a regular basis. It's a great way to get help and advice, in addition to Stack Overflow, of course. But it's great, and all these things are helpful, and hopefully they will continue to grow. This is the one that drives me crazy, and I hear this over and over again. Oh, well, we're, our company decided to use Spring Boot. We're not going to use Grails. And I almost want to shake them and say, look, everything in Spring Boot is in Grails. Grails 3 is Spring Boot, plus lots more. That includes the actuator, the stuff they're all talking about for doing profiling and administration. If you read the Spring Boot in Action book, it talks about this. I mean, Spring Boot is nothing fundamentally new. It's just an easy way to generate a Spring app with a lot of nice capabilities in it. Before, we had to pick and choose our dependencies and all that. Now you fill out a form, and it generates a Gradle build file or a Maven build file, and you're all set. And they do add this actuator stuff, but it's still a Spring app, and Grails works beautifully with this. Uh, Grails adds convenience, capabilities, and customization to Spring Boot. So, I, you know, and then they say, well, what about the Spring Data stuff? You know, the great way you've got all this generation of, of finders and everything. And I go, look, Spring Data generates about 14 or 15 methods plus more if you ask for them. GORM generates dynamic finders for every combination of attributes in your domain class. It also traverses associations. It also has the beautiful DSL for criteria queries. Criteria queries in Java in Hibernate are ugly and awkward. It's typical Java, the most verbose way to do anything. And the GORM DSL is elegant and clean. It's beautiful. And that's not even mentioning the WHERE queries because they wouldn't understand what those were. But there, all these mechanisms are built right into GORM. Everything Spring Data does is a tiny subset of what GORM can do for them, leading to the conclusion Spring Boot is Grail's light. You know, or Grails is Spring Boot plus plus, or I suppose that should be plus plus Spring Boot, right? We need to improve it and then, but um, yeah, it's like I always thought it should have been plus plus C rather than C plus plus, but that's just a little too pedantic. I'll move on. Uh, so I try to tell people if your company decides to adopt Spring Boot, that's fine. Everything you learn will translate right over into Grails when you finally decide to make your life easy, you know, and we'll see that. 
Okay, now a couple of common objections, and then we'll deal with the other stuff. Uh, this is one that comes up a lot, the quote by James, how do you pronounce it? Is it Strachan or Strachan? Uh, I can honestly say if someone had shown me that programming in Scala book back in 2003, I'd probably never have created Groovy. This was on a blog post he wrote back in April of 2009. And my response to that is in two stages. First, my first response is always, who? Uh, because, of course, he hasn't been involved in the language in over a decade. Guillaume Laforge took over within a couple years of the language being created, has been a wonderful steward ever since. I mean, I don't really care what James Strachan has to say anymore. Although I gotta say, the other response is, he's not finished talking, and when he does talk about Groovy, like on this Twitter uh, message I found from June of last year, he f says he forgot how much fun it is to use Groovy. I mean, so in other words, that quote taken in isolation is a bit misleading. You know, he really does still like it and still care about it. He just was excited about Scala for a while, which, okay, fine, more power to him. Okay, another objection that, that I always get when I talk to job developers is, isn't this slow? And I have to bring up, of course, compile static. And the point I bring up with compile static is that A, or the points I bring up is it produces as good or better bytecodes than the Java compiler would produce, and B, you can put it on a single method rather than on the whole class or the whole application. You can turn it on and off. So in other words, write your code in the groovy fashion because the, the developer productivity gains are enormous. Then profile it because where you think there might be problems are not necessarily where there are problems. And when you find those problems, try to do a judicious usage of compile static and see if that makes the problems go away. Or you can always just code that particular module in Java if it makes you feel better because Groovy and Java integrate without any problem at all. So this tends to at least get them to listen think, oh, okay, because by, by this point, I've shown them all the nice code simplifications. Anything I write in Java, I could write in about one-fifth, one-tenth as many lines of Groovy, and the Groovy code will be easier to read and easier to understand. Oh, I heard a good joke lately. Um, a million monkeys typing on a million typewriters will eventually type a Java program, and the rest of the programs will be Perl. <laughs> okay. I thought that was great. I saw that in a tweet somewhere, you know. Um, but again, Groovy is not trying to make the shortest code possible. It's trying to make the simplest code possible that's still understandable and useful. And that's definitely my experience. I really enjoy writing it that way. So we need something sexy, something that will really get people's attention, that will really be very persuasive. Now, I know whenever a speaker at a technology conference uses the word sexy, people start getting nervous. Uh, this field is full of boys behaving badly that do really dumb things. Uh, but I did try to find the sexiest picture I have ever seen. And this is it. Um, this is the astronaut capsule for the Dragon 9 rocket from SpaceX. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Oh my God, you know. Uh, thank goodness for Elon Musk. And speaking of Elon Musk, if anybody knows him, uh, see if we can get a hold of him because I'd like to do this. <laughs> Take those screens and put Groovy and Grails on them because why not, right? You know it would work just fine. Uh, so at any rate, there's my hope is that we'll be able to do something dazzling like that. A uh, long way to go for that gag, but oh, hopefully it was worth it. But it is finally time to address the elephant in the room. And by that I mean Gradle addressing, adopting Kotlin. Uh, there it is, that's the picture they had on their website. Or now we know why that Gradle fan looks so grumpy all the time. Uh, I had always assumed it's because it only had three legs, you know. <laughs> that would make me grumpy too, I get that. Um, this, of course, was announced about two weeks ago at a talk that Hans Doctor, the head of Gradle Incorporated, gave to a Kotlin user group in Silicon Valley where he announced that Gradle was going to support Kotlin and even recommend it for the plugin development. And the reasons he gave during the presentation, which you could find online, it's only about 12, 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, he talked about scaling issues, which made me nervous, and performance, which made me more nervous, and then IDE integration. Now, for the scaling issues, everything was coming down. When you come right down to it, it's all static versus dynamic typing. And, of course, that 
brings up a lot of interesting issues. Now, I'm on the No Fluff, Just Stuff tour, and therefore, when we have our little debates, we often will have a Scala developer in the same room with a Clojure developer. And the Scala developer is arguing in favor of static typing, catching your errors, and being required to have a rigorous type system. And they love words like covariant and contravariant and things like that. And they'll have massive arguments on their mailing list with the pure mathematicians, you know, trying to do everything right versus the people just trying to get the job done. Whereas the, the closure developers talk about how, look, I don't make a truck to carry around refrigerators and another kind of truck to carry around furniture and another kind of truck to carry around laptops. I make a truck and it just holds whatever it holds. It holds boxes, you know? And, and they just get into these arguments, which of course are not resolvable. They both do things well, they both do things poorly, and I get to sit in the back and go, hey, you know, if you want to put in a data type, put in your data type. If you'd rather say def, say def, you know? Or as Dear Koenig, the lead author on Groovy in Action, always like to say, if I'm coding and I think of a type, I type it, pun intended. You know, if I know this is a string or a date or an employee, I type string or date or employee. If I don't know or I don't care, I say def. So Groovy has always been the elegant middle on the static versus dynamic typing debate. And yet, why Kotlin? Well, first of all, the scaling issue. Now, there are plenty of examples of scaling with dynamically typed languages. Talk to people in Clojure or Python or Ruby, which all have their own issues, but scaling is not necessarily one of them, or even, you know, JavaScript people. I, I feel awkward saying that, but still, you know, scaling is much more about architecture than it is about the data typing. Static typing is good for debugging and for code analysis. It's not really about scaling in many cases, except to sometimes be limiting in terms of scaling. What about performance? Sure, dynamic typing adds issues, and Java back in the day had these real performance issues with reflection that caused us to avoid it. And yet now when we talk about concurrency, most of the modern functional programming recommendations involve removing all of your shared mutable state and instantiating new objects all the time and letting the garbage collector handle them. And back in the 90s, that would have been anathema to the, that would have been a horrible recommendation for performance, and yet now everything's been optimized so well, that's considered worth it, especially if you're doing concurrency, which is how you're getting your real performance now anyway. So I still don't see that as an issue. In fact, static typing is arguably premature optimization, and of course they have pills for that now, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. And besides, Groovy has static typing. That's what compile static's all about, as well as putting in your data type. And again, so this is not really the reason. You know, it's not scaling, it's not performance. That's the reason they went to Kotlin. The reason is IDE support. No question, because they have, Gradleware has terrible, Gradle Incorporated, pardon me, has all kinds of problems with their Eclipse support, and they have a lot of people adopting Gradle who are not hardcore developers, you know, who are DevOps people, or quote, build masters, who are not serious coders in many cases, and they want code assist on their Gradle build files, they want to, and then the people writing plugins want to be able to control click in, from the DSL into the classes and look at methods, and it makes it much more predictable and everything. Uh, static typing makes IntelliJ IDEA better, no question. And of course, who's surprised that IntelliJ IDEA would have a language that works best in IntelliJ IDEA, you know? I mean, Kotlin is, and believe me, I, Kotlin looks to be a great language. It really looks very, very nice and comfortable, and they learn lots of lessons from Groovy. I mean, all these languages learn from each other. I'm sure we'll learn something from them as well. Uh, it's very productive. So now what's Kotlin? Again, JVM-based language. It turns out it's also an island off the coast of Finland is where they got the name, interestingly enough. Near St. Petersburg, thank you. It's not, uh, well, it's, uh, it's near Russia then, or, or off of St. Petersburg in Russia. Um, it's a statically typed language, of course, that's the point. It just went 1.0 in April. So it's still very new. The current version I checked yesterday was 1.0.2. You know, it's very early on this. It is created and effectively owned by JetBrains. Lots of similarities to Groovy. They handle lambdas or closures, depending on how you define it. They have a safe navigation operator. They have an Elvis operator, you know? I mean, a lot of things that they have, they have picked up from all the other languages going around at the time. Lots of similarities to Groovy, and therefore the blog posts about about, Gro about Kotlin, sit, you sit there and go, we've done that in Groovy forever. You know, we already know about all this, but still, it's in there. 
What does it look like? I took this from the Kotlin homepage. You make a function main, and it's args. The, so the data type is after the colon rather than uh, before with a space. They've even got a print line method. Gee, I wonder where they found that. You know, they removed the semicolons. You know, I mean, it looks like it's a pretty easy thing for Groovy developers to pick up, or at least I, I expect so. Okay, in the Groovy community, we, we don't build ourselves up by tearing down other people. That's just not how we tend to operate in this community. I don't trash Scala or Clojure when I'm trying to sell people on Groovy. I like Scala and Clojure, and Kotlin looks really good. So instead of trying to say, well, gee, they should never take Kotlin because of these problems, let's look at the overall big picture of winners and losers here. Who wins now that Gradle supports Kotlin? Well, JetBrains, no question. I mean, Kotlin had a relatively small amount of mind share. It is used for some Android applications because Android is using a particularly awkward version of Java that makes the coding very verbose and very ugly. We've already seen Groovy apps. Our own app for Great Conf is a Groovy app that, you know, if you look at Cedric's code on the, on the um, GitHub repository, you'll see how much cleaner and easier it is to write in Groovy than in Java. Well, the same advantages accrue to Kotlin. So Kotlin Android apps are very clean and easy and understandable, look very nice. Of course, existing Kotlin developers just got a huge boost to their language and to anything they're doing. So what about losers? Well, who loses? First of all, Groovy loses, but not from inside. As I say, from inside the community, we're fine. It's not changing Groovy directly. The problem we have is two things. We're not going to get the same in influx of new developers who are coming in because they're using Gradle. If you're a Java developer in a company and your company decides to adopt Gradle as the build tool, it used to be you said, well, geez, I gotta learn some Groovy now. And then you wind up finding out Groovy can help you in a million other places and start learning it that way. Is that still gonna happen? Is it not? I think it's not clear at the moment. I mean, we're gonna have to ask Gradle. You know, I'm gonna be at the Gradle Summit. I'm gonna ask Hans, you know, I, does that mean I'm gonna have to learn Kotlin? Does that mean I'm gonna learn Gradle? Does that mean I have to learn both? Or Grails, a uh, Groovy rather? Or do I have to learn both? And the answer, I don't know right now. The full official support, by the way, is still a bit away. We'll have it by the end of the year. It, they just have a, basically a very early version at the moment. But again, we get this perception problem. They adopted Kotlin because they had problems. They couldn't get what they needed out of Groovy. And the reality is that's not true. There are fundamental reasons, and Cedric Champeau wrote a beautiful blog post detailing many of the technical issues. I highly recommend taking a look, getting into the problems with method missing and throwing exceptions and filling in the stack trace and how this led or can lead to performance problems, but that there are other ways to write Groovy for Gradle that don't lead to performance problems. Nevertheless, they decided to adopt Kotlin. What about Gradle Inc.? Well, the more I think about it, the more I realize this isn't clean for them either. This is a big gamble on their part. I mean, Kotlin is 1-0. Groovy's been around for, what, 13, 14 years almost now? It's mature, it's stable, we know the use cases, we know the idioms. We're at the stage now where we just add new things. We're not fundamentally rewriting the language. Collins 1.0, think about all the changes that happen in Groovy between 1.0 and now. This could be significant. It's not necessarily going to be clean and easy. They may run into problems that they didn't anticipate. What about all those millions of existing Gradle build files that use Groovy? Sure, it's possible to make a Gradle build file that purely uses the DSL, that doesn't write any custom Groovy anywhere. And you know what? I've never met one. Not longer than 10 lines, you know? Every significant project I've ever seen that has a Gradle build file, the developers cannot resist writing some Groovy in it. Why? Because part of the reason Gradle's so popular, every build is a custom build, ultimately. Every build needs to be customized to your system, to your conventions, to your processes. This is partly why Gradle's winning out over Maven, because Maven is so highly opinionated, it's difficult to customize. I'm not saying you can't do it, but in Gradle, it's trivial. It's very easy to customize, and people do. Now they get themselves in trouble, they put business logic in the build file. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't issues. But there's millions of examples of excellent Gradle build files that use Groovy, and now Gradleware is going to be constantly asked all the time, well, wait a minute, what about all these old Gradle build files that have Groovy in them? And they're saying, look, Groovy's not going away. Our support will be there indefinitely. To which point I go, 
okay, which should I learn? Should I learn Groovy? Should I learn Kotlin? Should I learn both? And I don't think they have an answer yet. And that's going to be hard on them. You know, we're going to have to be somewhat forgiving and understanding because I don't think this is going to be easy. By the way, Groovy is wonderful for DSLs, which is what Gradle is, right? Gradle's a DSL for your build. Um, I should give you, I know I'm a little over, but my DSL jokes, uh, Java's a DSL for generating stack traces. Uh, JavaScript is a DSL for detecting browser bugs. And, of course, um, Java uh, Maven is a DSL for downloading the Internet, right? At <laughs> any rate, Groovy is wonderful at building new dynamic uh, domain-specific languages, which is how they built Gradle in the first place. And it does this really well. What are they going to do with Kotlin? By the way, still need Eclipse support. Now, Hans kept pointing out they're going to have Eclipse support. Are they writing it? Is JetBrains writing it? Is JetBrains really going to be in the business of supporting a plugin for Eclipse instead of their own? Because they're going to have to be involved, even if it's people at Gradle Incorporated that are doing it. I don't envy the people at Gradle who are trying to manage this process. At first, everything's going to be wonderful. But when push comes to shove, of course, JetBrains is going to favor JetBrains. It's their incentives. Why wouldn't they? And, of course, it does indirectly help JetBrains to get Kotlin more widely exposed, and an Eclipse plugin will do that. But still, we're going to have to see how this plays out in the long term. So, frankly, I think time will tell as to whether this was a good idea or not and how it will eventually play in the industry. Right now, I would say there's no question, if I have to decide whether to learn Groovy or Kotlin, it's worth learning Groovy. I think we'll have to reevaluate that decision next year at this conference. So was it, you know, now that things have moved along, what happened, what changed, what do we decide now? Am I going to learn Kotlin? Yes. I mean, I have no choice. I teach Gradle, <laughs> okay? I mean, I'm going to have to find out how this works. Uh, again, my initial exposure has been very favorable. It, the groovy knowledge seems to translate right over. You know, it's just going to be one of those that's so similar it'll be confusing, I expect, you know? But do... Do new developers have to pick? I don't know yet. We'll see. By the way, uh, speaking of this, I saw a tweet, Python in home toilet bites man's genitals, you know. And the response, of course, inevitably was, that never happens in statically typed languages, you know. <laughs> I had to add that. <laughs> I wish I'd written it, you know. Let me give you the final part of this. Here's the home stretch. What's the best part about Groovy? And I, I, it's such a natural thing for us that I have to remind myself to tell people this. It's the community. I have never met a community where people are friendlier and more helpful and more understanding for newbies or anybody who has a problem. It's extremely useful and friendly. I saw a tweet just last week saying one of the most friendly software communities I've ever seen. I don't know about the Python community, but the, it's true. I mean, you see this sort of thing over and over and over again. It is a breath of fresh air for people coming from other communities that I won't mention, okay? It's just amazing. Groovy-related projects, experienced developers are very friendly and very helpful and willing to support and listen to dumb questions because we've all been there and we all work together. This comes from the top. People like Andre Salmire or Graham Roche, I even put Jeff Brown up there because I gave him a hard time before, and Guillaume LaForge, and I put Paul King up there, is not here, but is at many other conferences. These are all people who are among the most humble, brilliant developers I've ever met in my life. I, I still have to shake myself sometimes to realize that I get to participate in the same sandbox with these guys. It's, it's just so, such an honor. And I could add another dozen names without a problem at all. And, of course, then there's Dan Woods, you know, <laughs> Dan Veloper. And look what he did late last year in his post about his Learning Rat Pack book called Learning Rat Pack and Giving Back. He wrote in the blog post, he kind of buried the lead, but down there in a late paragraph, all royalties from Learning Rat Pack will go directly to the great ladies group to help sustain their work. That's amazing, and he should deserve all credit in the world for doing something like that. It's a very generous notion, and it does help, yes. Yeah. 
And the Great Ladies Group is wonderful at attracting new developers. They hold workshops, introducing people into the world. They do all kinds of great work. They're based in Minneapolis, but uh, Jen is here, uh, so feel free, Jen Strait. As a matter of fact, you should make a connection anyway. She's going to be here as a Fulbright Scholar at uh, University of Copenhagen. Is that right? Technical University of Denmark. I knew I was going to mess that up. Sorry. Uh, at any rate, she's here. Feel free to talk to her about the community or about the uh, well, anything, frankly, and, and the great ladies group. I mean, but this is the sort of thing that happens. Now, I don't feel, as a Groovy developer, we could take any credit for this. I mean, this was all Dan. But it's not surprising to me that the Groovy community attracts people who think this way. We're like this, and it's, it's a great asset. Now, one problem, of course, is that oftentimes your greatest strength is also your biggest weakness. It is possible that part of the reason we have problems is from a perception point of view is maybe our leaders are too humble. We don't have a benevolent dictator who tries to attract attention to himself all the time, you know, who's constantly looking for ways to, to do marketing and publicity. So that's our job. That's where we can help. Tell other developers about your experience with Groovy and related projects. Tell people when you got help and how easy it was to work and how, how willing everybody was to help you out in your Groovy experience. I mean, the bottom line, all of these projects from a technical point of view are excellent. They're healthy, powerful, successful technologies. Our problems are almost entirely perception ones, not reality. So we can alter the perception by going out and telling people and becoming your own groovy evangelist, if you will. And that's what I want to leave you with. So I will simply say thank you very much for coming and enjoy the rest of GreatConf. <laughs>